Hello everyone. Our topic for today is about microbial intracellular components. So these will focus on the structures and functions of the possible components that can be found inside of the cell of bacterial cells. Some cellular processes to, that occur in the cell are also discussed in this lesson. So at the end of this lesson, you will be able to identify the components found inside the bacterial cell wall. Describe the structures and functions of the components found inside the cell wall. So here is your motivation question. What do microorganisms use for their various metabolic processes? I hope you will be able to answer that one as we end our lesson for today. Okay. So the, this is a transmission electron micrograph of a bacterial cell that shows the different structures that are found you know, inside the bacterial cell. So they have plasma membrane that is underneath the bacterial cell. So we will be talking about all the components here. So last time, we talked about those that are found external. Then we also talked about the cell wall itself and now those that are found internal to the cell wall. So yeah, they have the bacterial cell have cytopl the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, the nucleoid, ribosomes, inclusions, and endospores. So the plasma or the cytoplasmic membrane or the inner membrane in gram-negative bacteria is a thin structure lying inside the cell wall and enclosing the cytoplasm of the cell. In prokaryotes, it is consists primarily of phospholipids, which are the most abundant chemicals in the membrane, as well as proteins. So you have here a phospholipid molecule, so it is composed of a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. No? So they make up uh, a double layer because the hydrophobic tails form hydrophobic interaction. No? So that all need hydrophilic heads are in contact with the watery environment outside and inside the cell. So the plasma membrane serve as a selective barrier through which materials enter and exit the cell. Plasma membranes have selective permeability, so sometimes called semi-permeability, which means that certain molecules and ions pass through the membrane. Others are prevented from passing through it. So what determines if a certain molecular ion can pass through it? So it depends on the size, charge, and polarity no, of the molecule. Plasma membranes are also important for the breakdown of nutrients and the production of energy. So in the, the membrane, some are, are found are in some species are you know, enzymes that help you know, in energy generation in the form of ATP. Others have, uh, mem have components that are able them to harvest energy from the sun or other, other uh, sources in order to produce their own food. You know? So there are membrane structures in some cells that are called chromatophores or thylakoids you know, that harvest energy you know, to photosynthesize. So, how do materials move in and out of the bacterial cell? So, materials move across plasma membranes of both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells with two kinds of processes, passive and active. So, in passive processes, substance cross the membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So, this is what we call concentration gradient or difference without the use of energy. Okay. However, in active processes, you no, know, this is a movement uh, against a concentration gradient. It is not go with the flow, but you are going against the flow. So you need you not know, to spend energy, just like you when you are swimming in the river in the ocean. Right? If you just go with the flow, you don't really spend a lot of energy. But you, if you swim against the flow of water, you really need a lot of energy. Okay, so movement of substances across the membrane is also like that. So passive processes no, include simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. So if it is just uh, the movement of certain substances across the membrane from area of high to low concentration, that is just simply diffusion. But we know that there are permeability factors like polarity, size, and 
and the the charge of the molecules if it is even though they are high concentration on the other side and low concentration on the other side if you no know, they cannot pass through because they are very big or they are polar then they could use other uh gate so with this there are what we call transporter proteins so they could be non-specific or specific transporters that would help him move across the membrane so just like this this is a specific transporter of glucose so glucose cannot pass through this because it's a big molecule so what it does it help it uh it uses a transporter to pass through so this is what we call facilitated diffusion you know? so uh, a transporter protein helps in the transport of the molecules from an area of high concentration to a low concentration still there is no energy that is being used now there are also what we call channels you know, or canals within the cell we know that water is highly polar so they cannot really uh they cannot really pass to they are in 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 theory they are not really allowed to pass through a non-polar environment however they are very small so some of them and since this the hydrophobic interaction is just a weak interaction so it, it, some of them could it could pass through the membrane however most of the water will enter the cell or go out of the cell via these water channels called aquaporins now because of that no there in many cases there is a net movement of solvent molecules across a selectively permeable membrane from an area with a high concentration of solvent molecules that means there is low concentration of solute molecules because uh, the, the concentration of solvent and solute are inversely proportional to each other so we call this net movement of solvent as the osmosis the diffusion is the, the movement of the Sol solute but osmosis is the diffusion of water so with that we refer to different tonicities now that we are referring to the, we identify three tonicities that refers to the concentration of solute outside the cell so isotonic hypotonic hypertonic solution so in an isotonic solution there is equal concentration of solute inside the cell okay so what happens is that since they're equal so the, the number of water the concentration of water that is going out and the water that is going in is equal so isotonic there are also hypotonic solution meaning there is low concentration of solute outside and high concentration of solute inside so if there is low concentration of solute outside there is high concentration of solvent outside the cell and since, and since there is low concentration and since there is low concentration of solute inside the cells, what happens is that although there are water that comes out and there are water that comes in, more of the water is coming inside. So what will happen? Now, just like a balloon that na napasubra ano butang o daghanya air, what will happen? It will burst. So just like a cell, if there is so much water that is coming in, it will eventually no lies. However, if the cell no, is in um, hypertonic solution, that means there is higher concentration of solute outside than inside. That means there is lower water concentration outside. So more of the water is going out. And so the plasma, the, the, plasm, the cell membrane, the cytoplasm is lysed. So this is what we call plasmolysis. It's actually the principle you know, when you have some people have their sore throat by a bacterial infection what they do is they gurgle uh, salt water or they, they gurgle you know, a salt solution so that that is to provide you no know, a an iso uh, a hypertonic environment for the bacterial cell to lyse although in some it may be effective but in others why do you deal so the a bacteria a bacterial cell needs to be always in isotonic solution with the environment so that it will survive so it really needs all the mechanism that it that it could use in order to stay alive in different environmental conditions now if there is already expenditure no, of energy that is already called an active process. So when a bacterial cell is in an environment in which nutrients are in low concentration, 
The cell must use active processes such as active transport and group translocation to accumulate the needed substances. Okay, so the cell uses energy in the form of ATP to move substances across the plasma membrane. Among the substances that are actively transported are ions, for example, sodium, potassium, no protons, calcium, and chloride, amino acids, as well as simple sugars. Now, active transport could also be in the form of could also use ion gradient. No to co-transport some part some um, molecule. So we have here co-transport of a substance a substance via this ion. So if there is ion gradient that occurs, it could they could be transported together you know, with the target molecule. Or they could be transported in a different direction. This is what we call antiport and this is symport. Now uh a uniport could be uh, active or passive depending on if there is energy expenditure, then a uniporter is an active no, process. Okay, so that was all for the, or that were all for the plasma membrane. Now let us talk about the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm for a prokaryotic cell, now the term refers to the substance of the cell inside the plasma membrane. It is about 80% water and contains primarily proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, inorganic ions, and many low molecular weight compounds. Inorganic ions are also present in much higher concentration in cytoplasm than in most media. Cytoplasm is thick, aqueous, semi transparent, and elastic. The major structures in the cytoplasm prokaryotes are nucleoid containing DNA, particles called ribosomes, and reserve deposits called inclusion so protein filaments in the cytoplasm are most likely responsible for the rod and helical shapes of bacteria prokaryotic cytoplasm lacks certain features of eukaryotic cytoplasm such as cytoskeleton and cytoplasmic streaming the nucleoid now is another structure that you can find inside the bacterial cell it is usually containing a single long continuous and frequently circular arranged thread of double stranded dna called the bacterial chromosome although in some species they could be linear no chromosome and they could be occur in multiple copies not just one but most of the bacterial cell have single no circularly double arranged double stranded dna now aside from that the nucleoid also you will find plus means okay so these are extra chromosomal genetic elements that are not connected to the main bacterial chromosome if this is the bacterial chromosome then some you know, of the genetic materials extra chromosomal genetic materials are called plus means they are these are the ones that are acquired you now by the bacteria from their environment so some confer selective advantage like antibiotic resistance or heat resistance or heavy metal resistance that the ones that help them survive in a certain environment it could be inherited by the other cells, but some of this may be lost no, in the uh, future generations of the bacteria. So usually these are taken through horizontal gene transfer like conjugation. Ribosomes are found in the in the nucleoid and is associated with the bacterial chromosome. They are the ones that help in protein expression or in the protein synthesis or in the translation. It is made up of small subunits and large subunits. So 30 Svedberg and 50 Svedberg and all together they make up 70 Svedberg no, ribosome. Inclusions on the other hand are reserve deposits. So in certain conditions when they are plentiful, so nutrients that are needed by the bacterial cell could be accumulated inside and use them when the environment is already deficient. No? So that it is a form of saving nutrients in order to uh save for the tough times so these are some examples of um inclusions that you can find you no know, in some types of bacteria now finally found inside in the bacterial cell wall are endospores so when essential nutrients are depleted so certain gram positive bacteria such as such as those of the genera costrigia and bacillus will form specialized resting cells called endospores Okay, so I think we have, we have already talked about this before. So the process of endospore formation is called sporulation. So what happens is that if the bacteria senses that they could not probably survive this condition, what they do, they replicate their genetic material. They enclose it in a very tough covering. Okay, 
tough, very tough layer and then the, it forms a spore coat and then it is freed from the cell. Now this in the spore will become dormant for many years until uh, a, an inv a, a condition is that is favorable for their growth is um, no, is encountered and so they will germinate. So many of these endospores will last you know, for many, many years. So in order for you to uh, to review this lesson, so here are the summary questions okay, for this lesson. What are the different components found inside the bacterial cell wall? And what are the structures and functions of these components? Okay, so that ends our lesson. I acknowledge again Ms. Maria Shredi the Esther Software the help in making the slide the slides now for the presentation. You can contact me or your lecturer for questions or clarifications regarding the topic. You can also key in your questions in the Facebook Messenger group chat. So thank you very much and see you again in our next lesson.